Nabil, I guess we want to start off with um, just explaining to us the household you grew up in and, uh, and the culture that you grew up in. Oh, well, uh, I grew up uh, in a devout Muslim home. And, you know, Muslims are from all stripes, a lot of different nations. And so uh, a lot of times people see Islam as kind of monolithic. Well, there's tons of different sects of Islam. And then uh, they're all from different regions. Turkish Muslims are different from Persian Muslims, are different from Arab Muslims, are different from Indonesian Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, my family is from Pakistan. And we were very, very devout. Many Muslims are nominal. Mm -hmm. And our family was devout. And so I was raised in a devout Pakistani immigrant family here in the States. And the way that looked for me was reciting the Quran every single day, mm. reciting my five daily prayers every day, uh, learning more and more about Muhammad and how he lived his life. Because that's what devout Muslims do. They try to emulate Muhammad in every little detail. If you see Muslims with beards yeah. of a certain length, yeah. it's because in the Hadith, the traditions about Muhammad, he had a beard the length of his fist and he used to trim his mustache. So you see Muslims looking like that, it's not a fashion statement, they're copying Muhammad. Uh -huh. And so I learned all about those traditions as I was growing up and tried my best to emulate him and to be a good Muslim. How about, did I'm you guys find that surprising? When I, when I was reading the book, I was surprised that there are so many different... The diversity. Yeah, diverse yeah. Uh, respects of Muslim, of Islam. There are different denominations, like there would be Christians, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Were you guys surprised by that? Well, what added to the drama of this story is that your heritage is... Muslim missionaries yeah. uh, yeah. and your pursuit of study was apologetics, mm -hmm. Islamic apologetics. Well, for me, it was a matter of truth. You know, it, there's, if, there's obviously a God, right? That's what I believed as a Muslim. There's obviously a God. And I thought the evidence was very strong. But it can't possibly be that everyone's paths are equally true because there's things about Islam that contradict Christianity. In Islam, you wouldn't ever believe that God came into this world or that God is triune or that God has a son. This stuff makes no sense. And so you can't just get away by saying, well, we're, we all believe what we want and it's all true. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so it was actually the truth matters which got me to start seeing Christianity as a potential uh, message that I would accept. Mm -hmm. So being told at, you know, in grade seven that you are an ambassador uh, for Islam, you're, you, this is your job. I mean, you don't just um, uh, represent uh, your family, but you also represent your people mm -hmm. in a way. So talk about the pressure of that because your mom talked about, you know, when, when they see you, we want to see that this is a good Muslim doing this. Maggie, it's, it's really strong, yeah. the pressure, not just because we're representing a minority. And in, in the West uh, right now, the, where the pendulum is swinging, minorities uh, have quite a voice, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition to that fact, Muslims come from an honor and shame paradigm, mm. the vast majority of them. Mm. And so what does that mean? Well, that means that your reputation as a group affects how you act individually. Right. What they decide kind of applies to you. So what looks good for them affects you in your life. The reason why uh, the vast majority of um, immigrant residents are from Pakistani, Muslim, or Indian areas is because of this honor shame paradigm mm. uh, in our culture. Uh, you could grow up and be one of three things. You could be a doctor, a lawyer, or a failure. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so it was kind of one so of those what things. Are you, that, Nabil? <laughs> well, well, it, well, and that's why I went to, to medical school, was yeah. because of these kinds of pressures that we're talking about. It was in medical school that I found Christ and accepted Christ, and ultimately, after graduating from medical school, I decided to go into ministry full time. But these are the, the strength of these pressures are unreal. And on a Muslim who's considering Christ, then, it really almost selects for people who are bold unless God does something amazing in their lives, which I think he does in many people's lives. It's, it's very, very difficult to leave that kind of a, a tight community. Mm. I think for the Christian church, we don't really have an understanding of that honor, shame, mm -hmm. you know, um, that, uh, dilemma. And I think for us too, just so helpful for believers in the Western church to hear the story, to understand the sacrifice and the cost that you are making, what you're giving up, the reality of your identity changing, what you've dealt with with your parents. When you describe your interaction with your father and mother and the tears in their eyes and the betrayal that they communicate to you, I mean, that, that was crushing me mm. as you are now taking up your cross to follow Christ. And I, I, was, just, I was just so impacted by that. Uh, Robbie, I can't tell you uh, how much that is true. Um, and I think it's something that the church in the West is missing. Uh, I think the vast majority of Christendom throughout history has had to deal with this. 
Um, you look at the Bible, it's full of statements like this, unless you love me more than your mother and father, mm. you're not worthy of me. Why would that verse be in there? Yeah, because right. people had to go through this. Or in Matthew chapter 13, you have two parables. Uh, you have the one where it's a pearl of great price. This man had to go and sell everything in order to buy this pearl. That's not a uh, hyperbole. He had to sell everything. Mm. Or this field with the treasure buried in it. He mm. had to go and sell everything, but he was rejoicing because this was worth it. Mm. And, and that message is found throughout the Bible. Mm. I want to talk about that journey a little bit more because we don't want to take for granted that some people might not know your story. How did you come to Christ? I know that David, a friend of yours, played a, a huge role in that, but you always had, you know, you were always searching. You were an inquisitive person from the get-go. And really a lot of that was because I was raised to think Islam was definitely true mm. and Christianity was false. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I saw some evidence that Christianity might be true, that was very intriguing to me. Uh, of course, it didn't strike me like that right away. Yeah. I was challenging my friend David to see and accept the truth of Islam, but he was able to start defending. And so it was in pursuit of truth and also to try to convince my friend Islam was true that I began investigating the evidence critically. Mm -hmm. Now you have to understand, in Islam, Muslims are raised in a very, very oral milieu. Mm -hmm. and so. I'm learning things about Muhammad from my parents, from my teachers, I'm receiving all this. And the Muhammad that I was taught about was amazing. The Islam that I had learned was a religion of peace and it was beautiful. But when it came down to verifying the truth and the actual original message that was taught, who was Muhammad really and what did he really teach? When I found how disparate that was from what I had been taught, that caused me enough cognitive dissonance to start approaching God and ask Him what His truth was. Recall that day when you were in your father's study reading the Quran and you see in black and white uh, Muhammad that you had never been taught mm -hmm. and you call your father in and he's just, he doesn't know how to respond. To yes, that. it was the hadith I was reading mm -hmm. and it was, a, it was the stories of things Muhammad had said and did and I'd been taught my whole life Muhammad was a religion of peace. Islam means peace and submission and that's what the image I had and then I start actually reading the records for myself and Sahih al-Bukhari volume number one, you just start reading through it Right off the bat, you have phrases like, uh, I will expel all Jews and Christians from the Arabian Peninsula. And you start seeing these messages of violence. And they weren't sporadic, they weren't few, they were pervasive. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, it was so powerful that the Muhammad that I had been taught about was an airbrushed picture. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that had a huge role to play in my revision of, of the truth in my mind. 50 to 70 percent of former Muslims have come to Christ through visions and dreams. Mm -hmm. God does this very special thing mm -hmm. uh, frequently, mm -hmm. there are the stats, for people who are locked into another way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And wow, did you, I mean, you didn't even know who Gideon was in the mm -hmm. Bible, but you sure put out some fleeces mm -hmm. because of your reverence for God and your sincere desire not to displease Him. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, there's a verse in uh, Surah Al-Baqarah, which is the second chapter of the Quran, which says, uh, God answers those who love Him and call out to Him. And then there was a verse in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find. So during this process, I'm like, God, I don't know who you are, but if you're the God of Islam or the God of Christianity, you've promised to respond when I call out to you. And so it was in faith that I was, I was really just waiting for him. Um, I knew he would respond because both faiths made that promise and he is faithful to his promises. Uh, and it was just a matter of being able to make it to that point. And it was very, very painful to wait, but uh, I knew he would respond at some point. One of the turning points of your, of your life, you communicated, is that moment where you're mourning the loss, really, of your family as it was and the intimacy. I love how close your family was, but you were saying, why God, why God, as in the separation of, from mother and father, but then the Lord communicated to you one of the turning points of your life, as you have communicated, it's not about you. That hit me so hard and um, we need to hear about that. Mm. Once you get the gospel message, it just blows your mind. Uh, I, I feel that as I've been ministering, I've had the privilege to minister, a lot of Christians have become numb to the gospel because they've heard it so much yep. that God would love you despite your sins. Whoa! You know, mm. most people around the world would never believe such a thing and that He would be willing to cast off His majesty and enter into this dirty, sinful world. You know, so many people recognize what Jesus went through on Easter and they see that cross and they realize what He went through and it's, this, He went through a lot. But I think He suffered even more humiliation 
on Christmas mm. when he became a human. Because this world is horribly unacceptable for someone like God, yet he entered into it. Yeah. And why did Nine he do this? Nine months gestation. I mean, just Serious. entering a womb. And, and why is he doing this? Because he loves us. Yep. And he wants us, after we receive him, he empowers us. That's why he gives us everything we, we need. You know, don't worry about where your food or clothes will come from. Don't worry about your salvation. I've got this taken care of. Why? Just so we can sit back and relax? No. So we can pour ourselves out for this hurting world the way he did for us. And mm -hmm. isn't forgiveness a rare treasure not available in Islam? This kind of unconditional uh, forgiveness that you can be secure in, yeah, that's, that's something that's, that's distinctly Christian. So Nabil, how do you talk to Muslims now? I mean, and how do they perceive your story? I mean, I was reading this book thinking, Nabil, I mean, like halfway through, I'm like, you have to just accept Christ now. Like, there's so much evidence. And, uh, and, and uh, walking with you through that journey, thinking there are probably so many Muslims, again, who are like, no, there has to be truth. There has to be truth in what I've been told time over time. So how do you relate to them and, and able to, to uh, witness to them? Well, for one, I know that it's not something that happens overnight. Yeah. The average Muslim, it takes them about seven years between hearing the gospel and having a faithful witness to actually coming to Christ. So it helps me to know that I need to just be patient. Mm. Um, also, to not see them as a project. Mm. You know, a lot of people see their Muslim friends as a project to share the gospel with. No, Christ loved people unconditionally. And God sent his reign on the just and the unjust. And we're called to love our neighbor, not love our project. And so uh, to just love the Muslims around you. Um, that's how I've, I've learned to relate because that's what worked with me. But to be ready to answer the questions as well. Mm. Um, you know, if you don't know the answers right away, that's fine. David didn't know all the answers, but he, was, he had faith in God to say, God, I need to know the answer to this question to help my friend. Can you help me find it? And he would do his homework and the Lord would lead him. Mm -hmm. And so all these steps, it takes time, it takes willingness, it takes humility. Um, and, and that's one way, I think, that uh, my eyes were really opened. Um, you know, my story is not just my story. It's a story of tens of thousands of Muslims around the world, hundreds of thousands of Muslims around the world who are coming to Christ today. Was there one piece of scripture, or one uh, nugget of information that David gave you that you thought, that's when you thought, okay, now I grasp it, I, now I understand? It was a long process and it was yeah, literally, it was like tectonic shifts happening in my mind. Plates had to move and preconceptions had to be changed and that took years and it was a slow, gradual process. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking at your credentials. Uh, armed and Dangerous, uh, MD from uh, Eastern Virginia Medical School, MA in Christian Apologetics from Biola, and MA in Religion from Duke University. Uh, you said last year 245 speaking engagements, 210 on the calendar for this year. You are using mm. that medical degree. Yeah. That'd be, tell us. Well, I do some medical missions work in Central and South America. Um, and I do that as I can, uh, not as much as I would like, but um, you get to see people in their hurt and in their need, and you get to minister to them in a very real way, and you get to share Christ with them. Um, I think in, in America, we're, and in North America, as it were, we're just so comfortable, you know, and, and we are so self-reliant. A lot of people say, I've never seen the Holy Spirit work. Well, when have you ever relied upon Him? Mm -hmm. um, and so, hurt, so th that to me is a powerful thing. Uh, also through medicine, I, I'm just m marveling every single day. Uh, I just, every, some, every now and then I'll be at a red light and I'll be thinking, wow, my heart's still beating. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about the process of what's going on there. There's a sinoatrial node, an AV node, you've got this little pacemaker internally in your heart and your brain's doing, I've never had any say in this, mm -hmm. but God loves me that much that he took care of that. My lungs keep breathing. I'm not controlling this, but God is that good. Mm -hmm. And so I think the uh, medical training, yeah, I get to use it, but I hope also to share those insights when I preach and minister, especially at university settings. Uh, being able to tell people I've studied uh, at the graduate level in clinical training uh, and I get to share those insights and the experiences in the hospital. When you were seeking Allah, were you expecting to have any kind of personal encounter with God? Mm. I don't know what I was expecting. All I knew was that I was searching for the truth and God is a God of truth and He would come through. Um, when I was still a Muslim, I was, what, I was, what I thought I would receive was Allah's confirmation in Islam, that He would show me how to refute Christianity. Um, and that's kind of what I was seeking, but then I had no idea 
I would meet this loving father. Uh, you know, Muslims are taught their whole lives, God is not a father. God has no son. Um, it's the first chapter we memorize as Muslims, usually speaking, uh, and we recite it so often. Uh, chapter 112 of the Quran, Muhammad said this chapter has the weight of one-third of the entire Quran. And what does this chapter say? Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He is not a father and he has no son. Uh, and, and that's kind of how I saw the world, but then to see God as my father, that mm -hmm. changed everything. Wow. You call it perhaps the greatest love story in history. Absolutely. Yeah. Agreed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Agreed. I want us to respect the, the fact that we're on the internet and there might be a, a Muslim person who stumbles upon this interview. What is one piece of advice or something that you can say to someone of Muslim faith to, to just get them thinking about what you've just said? Well, uh, if I could say anything um, to Muslims who are listening right now, it would be that I, I would expect you to hear a lot of what we're saying and to be either shocked by it or upset. And I totally get that. That was me too. Uh, and you might disagree with everything I said. That's fine. But I just want to tell you, God is so loving that it doesn't matter how much you sin, He still loves you. Uh, like your own parents, like my parents. They'd love me no matter what I did. God is certainly more loving than my parents. And He's opened up a way for all of us to be with Him forever. Uh, there's nothing I can do. I know this about myself. There's nothing I could do to earn my way into God's presence. He's perfect. I could never be perfect by myself. And I think you know that too. You could never be perfect by yourself. God has to do that for you. And He did. Um, God actually took your sins upon Himself. He paid that penalty. I know you're thinking, well, maybe why can't God just forgive my sins if He wants to? Well, God is an absolutely just God, which means every single sin has to be paid for. Otherwise, He'd be arbitrary. So the fact that He's an absolutely just judge means He had to pay for those sins Himself. And He did. And He loves you. And He wants to know you and have a relationship with you and you can with Him. So forget all the terminology, forget all the words, forget everything you've been taught and just seek God with everything you have. And I'm telling you, no matter what the cost, no matter what you have to pay, it is worth it to know the God of truth.